Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ben Schlidel Academy. This is How to DM the First Edition AD&D with me as your teacher. How about that? I'm going to do a quick share screen here now and bring up the whiteboard, which we'll be using quite a bit during today's class. Whiteboard. OK. How to DM First Edition AD&D with myself of Ben Schlidel Academy. Today is Saturday, April 17th. It is the year 2021. And warning, this is potentially NSFW. Not definitely, but potentially anyway. OK, so how to DM first edition A, B, and B? Well, it all begins with understanding the standard playable races that are allowed to the characters in this edition. These are the seven standard playable races in first edition AD&D. &D. And it is always character's choice, of course, unless the DM has pre-generated characters in mind for the players to use. At any rate, they are human, elf, dwarf, halfling, gnome, half-elf, half-orc. Unfortunately, there's no real helpful anagram here for quick remembering of what the seven are, but this is what they are as outlined in the 1978 Player's Handbook. And you can find information about the playable races in the Player's Handbook starting around page 15, I do believe. You'll have to double check me on that. And But at any rate, they are human, elf, dwarf, halfling, gnome, half-elf, and half-orc. Those are the standard seven playable races allowable players to use according to the 1978 Player's Handbook which is, by the way, not a rule book. It is a handbook, much like the Dungeon Master's Guide is also not a rule book. That is a guidebook. It is generally and widely understood that taking a strict rules as written or a strict by the book approach to the hobby is selling yourselves short. I encourage everyone in the classes here to expand themselves a bit and to mix their own cocktails, as it were, when it comes to how they choose to approach being a dungeon master. First edition AD&D &D is something that began in 1977 and lasted until 1989. Those were, and still are, considered by many to be the golden years of the hobby. A lot of expansion happened there. The United Kingdom even got involved a little bit. TSR UK was a thing for a time. I remember being a young lad and being very impressed by that, actually. It was 1978 when I started playing. That was the first year of the Player's Handbook. The Dungeon Master's Guide followed the following year, 1979, and our groups just continued to have more and more fun with it. So these are the seven playable races available to players when they begin. Of course, feel free to mix and match, add your own, refer to Dragon Magazine for other ideas or any other ideas that might come along the way. The next thing we must discuss Nope. There we go. OK. Nope. OK. Strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma. These are the attributes commonly referred to as stats. Now, generally speaking, player characters and non-player characters will have these attributes. Monsters, generally speaking, will not. Creatures will 
certainly have an intelligence score, but as for the others, that's entirely up to the dungeon master. Remember these six attributes and make sure that as a dungeon master, your players have a clear understanding of what each of them are. And also make sure that your players have a clear understanding that one of these attributes will be their prime requisite. The prime requisite is as follows. If you are a fighter or a subclass of fighter, such as ranger or paladin, for example, strength becomes your prime requisite. If your strength is 15 or more, you qualify for 10% bonus experience points at the end of each session. If you are a magic user or a subclass thereof, such as illusionist comes to mind, intelligence will be your prime requisite. If your score is 15 or greater in intelligence, you qualify for the 10% bonus experience points at the end of the adventure session. If you are a cleric or a subclass of cleric, wisdom is your prime requisite. If you have a wisdom score of 15 or greater, you qualify for 10% bonus XP. If you are a thief or a subclass thereof, dexterity is your prime requisite. 15 or greater in dexterity gets you 10% bonus XP at the end of your session. So those are the six attributes. There is a seventh attribute that is sometimes used, but most times not. And this is the attribute called comeliness. Comeliness is a forgotten first edition AD&D attribute that is rarely seen. In fact, you'll never really see it on any of the pre-printed character sheets that you find for this edition. But comeliness is out there. And this is something that is similar to charisma, but it has its own definition. And if you are more interested in learning about comeliness, feel free to investigate it Google is your friend. The next thing to discuss is time. Excuse me, uh, Tim. Uh, as far as uh, are there yes, any Phil. are there any types of characters where charisma or constitution is is the prime requisite? There are not. Okay. One might think that a paladin should have a prime requisite in charisma because to be a paladin, you need a minimum charisma score of 17. But no, paladin is a subclass of fighter. So therefore, prime requisite is strength. And okay, so for time, the passage of time is very important. Time is broken down into segments, rounds, and turns. One turn is 10 minutes of game time. One round is one minute of game time. One segment, six seconds of game time. Therefore, you have 10 rounds in one turn and you have 10 segments in one round. How many segments are in a turn? Well, the answer is 100. Time is broken down in this way and is illustrated further by referring to the player's handbook and looking at the spell lists, looking at casting times. There you'll sometimes see that the casting time for a spell might be one turn, such as speak with dead. This means that the magic user casting speak with dead would need to perform 10 minutes of game time's worth of spell casting using verbal components, using material components, and perhaps physical components as well, referred to as somatic. To cast spells, components are Sometimes not required, but most times they are. And the components are either material in nature, such as a pearl worth 100 pieces of gold, or an owl feather that's been steeped in wine, or a miniature carp, AKA goldfish. 
Examples of somatic material components involve movements of the hands. Now this, of course, can be improvised by the players. That's no big deal. And of course, if the players wish to create their very own stylized somatic material components for the casting of their spells, all the better. Remember, the role plays the thing. Back to time. During combat, time is broken down into rounds. The term turns rarely comes into play during combat situations. Rounds are one minute of game time each. <clears throat> during combat, some characters might be able to attack more than once in a round. Characters starting out will only be allowed to attack once in a round. And during the combat, if they choose to do something combat oriented, such as attack their opponent, which certainly qualifies as combat oriented, that would eat up the entire round for them in the combat. If they were to do a minor action of some sort during the round, perhaps they want to just move 20 feet to the left and then stop there and try to remain quiet or something else. Perhaps they want to go and visit one of their comrades to hand them a weapon or to hand them a healing potion. That can eat up time during your round in the combat, but will it eat up the entire round? Of course not. Rounds are broken down into 10 segments and each segment has a duration of six seconds. A dungeon master might say that if the player wants to move 20 feet to the left, and their movement rate for their character is 100 feet per round, well then if he's moving two 10 inch squares on a map I'm thinking of, but 20 feet to the left, that will eat up two of the 10 segments in the combat round. For example, if I'm the fighter and I'm attacking a giant spider, but I don't want to attack it head on, I want to see if I can somehow try to put myself in a position where I can flank it in a later round. Well, I'll move 20 feet to the left. That eats up two of my 10 segments in the round. This leaves me with a total of 48 seconds of game time during the round to still do something during this round of quote unquote combat. Once the initiative rolls are made, that's when combat begins. But prior to that, it's just all a bunch of sneaking around and positioning yourselves in situations like that when faced with a giant spider, for example. So <clears throat> this is how time is broken down. And time slows down quite a bit during first edition A, B, and D, as I'm sure it probably does with some of the later editions too. Time slows down quite a bit during these sessions, and that's normal, but it's okay and it is also the job of the dungeon master to make sure that the time keeps moving. Don't want to get stuck spinning your wheels in the mud, flipping through books, trying to find some sort of a quote unquote rule on something. You're the dungeon master, just make a ruling and move on. Keep it going, try not to disrupt the momentum of the adventure. So I think that's about all we need to do with time. So the next thing uh, we'll talk about is, I'm sorry, you have a question? So when we roll initiative and then we call, you know, we go around the table based on initiative order, we're doing one round a piece all within that same round. We're in round one and everybody is, is doing their first round. So they could do up to a minute's worth. Is that correct? That's correct. That is correct. Okay. And then the next minute begins, which would be round two. Or as they say in Mortal Kombat, round two, fight. Okay, the next thing we need to talk about is space. And I don't mean outer space. I'm talking about space in terms of length and width and the measurement of space. Whoops. Ten inches equals one hundred feet. Now that's some interesting math. 
allow me to explain. In the player's handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual, Gary Gygax refers to measurements in terms of 10 square feet. 10 square feet, whoops, equals one inch on the mat or the battle mat. If you are laying out a one inch square grid on the table to use for your wet erase pleasure, then you will have the one inch representing 10 square feet. Movement rates for characters will largely depend on what race they are. If you are an elf, your movement rate might be 12 feet. I'm sorry, 12 inches rather. 12 inches equals 120 feet. Not minus equals, there we go, 120 feet. Meaning that if I was playing an elf, I could move 120 feet during my one round of combat. That is a movement rate per minute. Whoops. Dwarves, gnomes, and halflings will have much shorter movement rates than the elf. Human movement rate is generally 10 feet per round, meaning that a human can move up to 100 feet during a round. If I was playing a thief and I wanted to move 90 feet towards my enemy and then stop there to do something else, I could do it. Within my combat round, by moving 90 feet, I eat up nine of my 10 segments, leaving me with one segment left, six precious little seconds, during which I can choose to do whatever minor action I can think of. As for whether or not the dungeon master will allow it, that's to be determined. But by moving only 90 feet in a round and then stopping there to leave yourself with some time to do something else for six seconds of game time, that's where you would be. Dwarves, halflings, and gnomes have movement rates that are generally closer to the six inch area, which is the same thing as 60 feet. So if I were playing a halfling and I wanted to move during a combat round, I could move 60 feet towards my opponent and stop there. Let's say my opponent is a giant spider 100 feet away from me and my combat round begins. Now I'm a halfling. I can move up to six inches on a battle mat grid, which is the square inch grid maps and advance a full 60 feet leaving me still 40 feet away from my opponent, but at least I'm advancing. Or perhaps I'll just go 50 feet, stop there, check my weapons, make sure I've got a bow and arrow that's ready to go or something to that effect. Or maybe I'll drink a potion of speed during those remaining six seconds of the round. So that's about space. Sometimes in the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide, um, you'll see references made to one inch, which equals 10 square feet in the context of spellcasting. Spells will have area of effect that varies depending on the description of the spell that you'll see listed in the player's handbook. Whether you're playing a magic user or an illusionist or a cleric or a druid, there will be different area of effects to watch out for. Some of them will be involving a radius, some of them involving a diameter, and some of them involving just linear. But these are things to be mindful of as dungeon master, and it's not that hard to get a handle on. While you won't necessarily see too much description in how to go into deciphering and interpreting and using the measurements that appear in the books, the first edition A, B, and D, as long as you have this basic foundation of fundamental knowledge with regards to space, you'll do just fine.
The next thing we should discuss is sizes. Sizes. Sizes appear as S, M, and L in the books. The sizes mean small, man-sized, large. Some opponents will be larger than man-sized, therefore their size is considered large. Because they are a large opponent, it means that your weapon will be doing a different amount of damage to the opponent than it might if it were a small opponent or a man-sized opponent. For example, if you were to use a longsword against an opponent that is either small or man-sized, the longsword has a base damage of 1d8. If you were to use that same weapon against an opponent that is larger than man-sized, <clears throat> excuse me, the weapon would deal 1d12 damage. To further illustrate this, if you were to use a bastard sword against a small or man-sized opponent, and you were to use one hand on the weapon, it would deal 2d8 points of damage. If you were to use a bastard sword against a large opponent, it would deal 2d8 damage. So any anywhere from two to 16 points of damage versus a large opponent. Whereas anywhere from two to four, I'm sorry, two to eight points of damage versus small or man-sized. That's with just using one hand on a bastard sword. A character can also place a second hand on that sword and get a real hard swing in on it. The bastard sword is also known as the hand and a half sword. It's not quite a two-handed sword, but it's also not quite a short sword or a long sword or a broad sword for that matter. It's very much its own thing. You can use the bastard sword with two hands if you choose to do so. Well, you won't be wielding a shield. So that'll hurt you when it comes to armor class. And we'll be speaking about armor class next in just a moment. But as far as sizes are concerned, sizes of opponents also have an effect on the range of weapons being used against them. <clears throat> Range weapons, such as bows and arrows, crossbows, slings, throwing axes, darts, throwing daggers, spears, javelins, and so on. If you were to throw, let's say, a spear at a small opponent, you can do it within a range of 10 feet. If you were to throw a spear, at a man-sized opponent, you can do it within a range of 20 feet. If your opponent is large and you're going to throw a spear at it, you can hit within 30 feet. And it's a similar trend, one, two, and three. Using a club versus a small opponent, same thing, within 10 feet. Club versus man-sized, within 20 feet. Club versus large opponent, you can hit your opponent within 30 feet. So you see, the size of your opponent has the effect on the range within which you can choose to attack your opponent. Moving on to a more standard range weapon, the bow and arrow. If you were to use a short bow, you could hit a small opponent within 50 feet, a man-sized opponent within 100 feet, and a large opponent within 180 feet. Just because you can hit your opponent within those ranges, it doesn't mean that you will. You can certainly fire your weapon and hope that your missile hits its target. You, however, have control over your range as a player. As a dungeon master, it's important to be mindful of the sizes and how they affect the ranges of weapons being used against them. Now, speaking of weapons being used against, let's talk about armor class. Armor class determines how tough you are to hit. That's really the most easy way to explain it. In first edition AD&D, we have what's known as descending armor class, or AC for short. 
Descending armor class means that if you are wearing no armor, your armor class is zero. If you are wearing plate mail with a shield, well, that's much better than wearing no armor at all. Plate mail with a shield gives you an armor class of two. If you are just wearing plate mail with no shield, your armor class becomes three. The higher your armor class score is, the easier it is for your opponent to hit you. Timothy? Yes, sir. I think that uh, no armor is 10. Oh, that's right. My mistake. It is 10. Okay. Because Thank it's you, the Augusto. sanding. It's the sanding. Okay. That's right. I apologize. It is indeed 10. Your armor class is 10 when you are wearing no armor. And then you have the other armor that allows you to have better armor class, such as leather, which will improve your armor class. And by improve, meaning having your armor class descend and become a lower number. The lower your number is in armor class, the more difficult it is for your opponents to hit you. And then there's chain mail, splint mail, ring mail, banded mail, and so forth. Different kinds of armor that can improve your score. Each time you have a shield, it improves your armor class score by one making it be one less. So for example, with an armor class of three, wearing plate mail by picking up a shield, my armor class becomes two. And remember, the lower your armor class is, the easier it is for you to remain safe from the strikes of your opponents. The harder it is for you to be hit and harmed. When you are wearing a helmet, it makes the armor class of your head equal to the rest of your body. If you are not wearing a helmet, your armor class of your head is 10. If you are wearing plate mail with a shield and no helmet, your armor class of your body is two, but the armor class of your 10 I'm sorry, the armor class of your head remains 10. This is important because if your opponent is going to declare uh, a called shot to the head or some sort of a head strike, or I'm just going for it with a beheading right here. And if your opponent has no helmet, the armor class of your opponent is 10. Whereas if you are wearing plate mail with a shield and having a helmet, the armor class of your head becomes two. It slides right into alignment with the rest of your body. So again, no helmet, your armor class for the head is 10. With helmet, armor class for head is same as rest of the body. You, you are not able to use your shield to protect your, your head, even if you don't have a helmet? You could. Okay, you, one more to make nine? You could certainly use the shield in an attempt to block an incoming head strike, but the armor class of your head itself still remains 10 until you put a helmet on. So, by the way, the better an armor class gets, the lower the number drops. And it's not uncommon to see that number dropping down into the negatives. If I had an armor class of negative four, that's pretty damn good. That's probably an indication that I'm wearing A, magical armor, B, powerful ring of protection on right hand, C, powerful ring of protection on left hand, and I probably have an awesome dexterity score, which improves the armor class by quite a bit if you have a nice dexterity score. As a dungeon master, it's important to have a good handle on armor class and you can certainly find all the information you need with regards to armor class in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Have a look at page number 79. You want to jot that down here. I'll just go ahead and type it into the whiteboard. Page 79 of the, of the Dungeon Master's Guide has information that you need to know regarding armor class. It's also commonly found on a Dungeon Master screen. It's one of the most important matrices that a DM has to refer to from time to time. 
And I'll just go ahead and open up my trusty page. Uh, 79, uh, nope, my mistake. It's not 79. The page I meant is, wait, that's not that page either. Oh, where are you on a class page? Are you 78? Let's see. Well, and I should. 75. No, that's 75. 75, no. It is around there somewhere we'll get back to that maybe we'll have that be a homework assignment in the meantime now that we've talked about armor class a little bit let's talk about the next big thing the next big thing is hit points hit points are handled interestingly in first edition a b and b of course the dungeon master always has an awful lot of leeway and they can choose to handle it however they want but the dungeon master's guide goes into hit points quite a bit and talks about how to handle all that. The Dungeon Master's Guide from 1979 talks about hit points and what happens when you lose them all. Dun, dun, dun. Well, according to the Dungeon Master's Guide, when a monster is reduced, say from 50 hit points to zero hit points, the monster is not dead. Sounds crazy, right? I know. Well, the Dungeon Master's Guide says that a monster will remain alive until it is reduced to 10 hit points below zero. At 10 hit points below zero, it is dead. This is according to the 1979 Dungeon Master's Guide. And it also goes on to say that with regards to player characters, if a player character is reduced from 50 hit points to zero hit points, they go unconscious. If they continue to lose hit points because they are bleeding or losing hit points per round for whatever reason, let's say get down to negative five hit points. Still alive, in bad shape though. And the Dungeon Master's Guide uses the word comatose. Now, I don't know if you folks wanna play with coma in your game. If you want to, that's fine. It's just a guide. It's not a rule. Remember, another interesting thing in the Dungeon Master's Guide regarding loss of hit points is that if a character gets healed, healed back from negative five hit points, for example, back all the way up to, oh, let's say five hit points, then it means that that character now must rest for a whole week before they can resume adventuring. <laughs> Not just a week of real time. We're talking about a week of I game time. And um, <clears throat> there's a bit of chatter in the background there. If you if you would be so kind as to mute your mic, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. And um, so let's see. We actually want to be able to bring my players and have them fight his players. Like, want a dual game? Like, we want to like Grip, if you, could un if you could mute yourself, please do so. Please stop being disruptive during the class. And, um, and pl please mute your microphone and be considerate to me and to everyone else uh, in the class with us. Thank you. OK. so. After we've talked about hit points a little bit, let's also now talk about hit dice, hit dice. Monsters and creatures generally do not have levels like player characters will and like non-player characters will. Instead, monsters and creatures have hit dice. In first edition AD&D, D8 D is the hit die. Some creatures will have one D8, these are very small creatures, generally weak. Some creatures will have much greater amounts of hit dice. For example, the troll. The troll has six plus six hit dice. So it would be six D eight plus six. And that would be your hit points for a troll. Since monsters do not have levels like characters do, but they rather have hit dice instead. 
it's helpful to know that you have page 75 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to refer to where you can find the attack matrix from monsters. This is also commonly found on a Dungeon Master screen, but since we're just looking at the books themselves today, let's all go ahead and take a peek, uh, take a peek at page number 75. In the middle of page 75, you'll see the attack matrix for monsters. Up and down the column on the left, it shows you the opponent armor class. Sliding across the top from the left to right, it shows you the different hit dice broken down so that you can clearly see the columns that pertain to each monster you are attacking your unfortunate player characters with. We talked about the troll a moment ago. The troll has six plus six hit dice. The column that you would use for attacking as a troll would be the column atop, atop there that says 6-7. And that means it is the column for any monster with a hit dice ranging from 6 to 7. With the troll having 6 plus 6 hit dice, that puts it right in that range, which puts it right in that column. Now, if the troll was going to be attempting to attack an opponent that, let's say, is wearing plate mail with a shield and a helmet, but dexterity score of 14, that means that the troll is going to be using the matrix here to see how armor class two matches up with its column for it to hit the opponent. If I have a look at it, it shows me that the answer is 11, indicating that to hit the opponent, the troll must roll 11 or better on a 1d20. But that pertains to combat. And we're not really going to talk about combat much here at all today. That's for one of the later sessions in our course. So hit dice. You will often see hit dice referred to in stat blocks as well. Stat blocks are found, well, commonly found in the monster manual. You could turn to any page in the monster manual and you'll find a stat block. In fact, I just happen to have a monster manual handy here with me. And if all of the rest of you here in the classroom with us now have access to your very own 1977 monster manual, please open it with me together now. And we'll take a look at the page number 47. Page number 47 of the Munster Manual will show you the stat block for goblins. Now the stat block for goblins is a fairly rudimentary stat block. And it shows you what the frequency is, what the number of appearing is, the armor class, their movement rate, and their hit dice. Now, for the goblin, it says that the hit dice is only one to seven hit points. So goblins will never have more than seven hit points, so they are less than one hit dice. Because they are less than one hit dice, this means that on page 75 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, you will look to find the column that says minus one that slides across the top there on the attack matrix for monsters. And then that will give you your column, letting you know what you need to roll out of 1d20 to hit your opponent. <clears throat> it's not easy for goblins to hit their opponents because their hit dice is so small. It means that they are virtually non-lethal. I use the term virtually loosely there, by the way. And so that's a bit about hit dice and a bit about stat blocks. Let's stay with stat blocks, though, for a moment. And let's stay on page 47 of the Monster Manual while we take a look at what else appears in the stat block. Looking at a stat block, if you are a beginner dungeon master, 
could be a bit confusing. Well, here at Benchley Dale Academy, we're, we're here to be that, light, that lighthouse for you that guides you safely to shore. The Goblin Stop Block gives you the frequency of them. And for frequency there, it says uncommon. Okay, well, how should you interpret uncommon? Well, uncommon is a fairly easy word to interpret. As the dungeon master, you're allowed to interpret it however you choose. If a goblin would commonly be seen walking around town, well, then it would be common, but you would not frequently be seeing that. So therefore it is uncommon. As the dungeon master, you ultimately decide when they will appear and no one would fault you for it. Now, number appearing, it says here 40-400. This means that goblins could appear in a multitude ranging anywhere from 40 goblins up to 400 goblins. That's how many would appear at any one time. Does this mean that your party would never encounter one lonely goblin? Of course not. Remember, you're the dungeon master. And the books that we're looking at here are really just only guidebooks. Anywhere from 40 to 400 goblins, though, is what the Munster Manual says. It also goes on to say that the armor class for a goblin is six. Okay, we've got a handle on armor class now. We know that armor class of six is better than an armor class of 10, which means no armor. And we know that armor class of six is not as good as the armor class of two, which is if someone were wearing plate mail with a shield. So goblins have armor class of six. Goblins also have a movement rate of six inches. Now, six inches indicates that they could move six square inches on a battle mat. Battle mat with 10 square feet per inch. I should spell movement, right, shouldn't I? Okay, there we go. All right. This means that a goblin can move up to 60 feet in one round, which is the same as one minute. The hit dice for the goblin is one to seven hit points. As mentioned earlier, this puts it into the minus, whoops, minus one H, HD category when referring to page 75 of the DMG. Next up in the stat block, we have percentage and layer. The percentage and layer listed here is 40%. This essentially means that they're home 40% of the time. As for the other 60% of the time, well, they could be out stirring up trouble, doing my favorite goblin trick, which is to uh, throw flasks of oil and lit torches at parties trying to get a good uninterrupted eight hours of rest in the woods. So they will be found in their lair 40% of the time. If someone tells you there's a goblin lair five miles away from here and some pretty cool treasure in it, You'd be like, hell yeah, and you start making your way towards the goblin lair. Will there be goblins in there? Well, there's a 40% chance of it, according to the Munster Manual. But remember, you as Dungeon Master are free to change that percentage to be however you would like for it to be. Up next in the stat block is treasure type. Every monster listed in the Munster Manual has a treasure type associated with it. Sometimes the treasure type will be A, sometimes it will be B, or C, or so on down the line. In the Monster Manual, to find the treasure types, all you need to do is have a look at page number 105. 
page 105 of the Munster Manual, will show you all of the treasure types listed from A to Z. There are 26 different treasure types, one for each special little letter of our language. They are quite different from each other. If you have the Munster Manual in front of you now, turn with me to page 105, and let's have a look at the treasure types section. And let's take a look at treasure type listing A, the very first one on top. Treasure type A shows that creatures killed will have anywhere from one to 6,000 pieces of copper 25% of the time. They will have anywhere from one to 6,000 pieces of silver 30% of the time. They will have 1,000 to 6,000 pieces of electrum 35% of the time and so forth, right on down the line. And towards the right-hand side of that page, you'll start to see gems, jewelry, maps, or magic also get listed. A creature with a treasure type of A, if killed, would have anywhere from four to 40 gems 60% of the time. You would essentially be rolling your percentile dice as a dungeon master to determine. And if you were to roll 61% or greater, there would be no gems for the party. So sad. Had you rolled 60 or lower, there would be anywhere from four to 40 gems. And that's what I call party time. It doesn't specify the kinds of gems. Isn't that curious? Well, it's a dungeon master's job to do that. You see, imagination is the most powerful tool in the toolbox of a dungeon master. You could on the fly decide that you want these gems to be sapphires or emeralds or diamonds or white onyx, whatever it might be, could be a mix. Maybe it's 40 gems and each one is different from the next. And just for fun, you decided to write down a list of 40 different types of gems. You see, that's the magic of imagination. You can just fill in the gaps right there. The monster manual puts you on the path. And as a dungeon master, you then boldly take the steps forward. Let's have a look at another treasure type on page 105. Let's take a look at treasure type Y. Treasure type Y is all the way down towards the bottom of page 105. No copper, no silver, no electrum. Maybe some gold, anywhere from two to 12,000 gold, 70% of the time. No platinum, no gems, no jewelry, so sad. Not even a map or a thing of magic, but all that gold. So now that you have a bit of a better understanding on treasure types, why don't we go ahead and move on to the next part of the goblin stat block, which brings us to before we advance, I am going to just mention one more thing about treasure type because for goblins, it specifically does say here, individual goblins have treasure type K. However, if you find them in their lair, it becomes treasure type C. For some monsters, it will just say treasure type A or treasure type nil. For example, golems are treasure type nil. But here we have a, a bit of an interesting breakdown. Individual goblins, treasure type K. Goblins in their lair on moss, treasure type C. After treasure type in the stop blocks, number of attacks. This indicates how many times a monster can attack during one round of combat, AKA one minute of game time. Goblins have a number of attack score of one. So once per round, a goblin will attack. 
not much more to talk about there. Moving on through the stop block, we have damage per attack. Okay, so how much damage does a goblin do using its one attack per round in combat? According to the 1977 Monster Manual, the answer is one to six or by weapon. If a goblin is manning a large goblin ballista and shooting it at a large opponent, it would likely be doing more than 1d6 points of damage. If it's going to be using a magic sword, then a similar situation applies where it would be doing more damage. 1 to 6 points of damage during one round of combat is determined by rolling 1d6. You probably knew that already. I'm sure most of you did, but it's nice to have the refresher, isn't it? Okay, so we've gone all the way through the stat block here. Frequency, number of appearing, armor class, movement, hit dice, percentage and lair, treasure type, number of attacks, damage per attack. Up next in the stat block after damage per attack is special attacks. Goblins have no special attacks. Okay, up next after that is special defenses. Goblins have no special defenses. Up next in the stat block is magic resistance. Goblins have standard magic resistance. Now, understanding standard magic resistance indicates that what they are entitled to is a saving throw versus magic like anyone else is or spells. It's not a straight percentage for magic resistance as you'll sometimes see with more powerful monsters like 50% or 75% or 100% like Unga from Isle of the Ape. Dun, dun, dun. But goblins, standard. So they qualify for saving throws in certain situations regarding magic or spells at the discretion of the dungeon master. Okay, up next after magic resistance in the stat block, we have intelligence. The monster manual provides each monster with an intelligence attribute or stat or score. You can call it whatever you like. It still means the same thing. Goblins have intelligence of average and then in parentheses, Gary Gygax writes low. All right, average low intelligence is considered five and below as far as I'm concerned. But as for you as a dungeon master, that's for you to decide. If you want it to be four and below, that's fine. Whatever you feel fits your game, that's perfect. Up next after intelligence in the stat block, it lists the monster's alignment. Goblin alignment is lawful evil. Does that mean every goblin in your world is lawful evil? Of course not. Does it mean that the vast majority of them are? Oh, yes, it does. There will always be mavericks, and there can always be mavericks. And so lawful evil. Alignment is something that we're going to discuss in a future session. But for now, we're going to move right on through the stat block. We will save alignment for when we discuss combat. Up next is size in the stat block. It says here that goblins are four feet tall. This means they are small. And it seems like there's some noise coming through somebody's channel there. Can you please mute? Thank you. Size four feet tall, which means they are small. Small in the sense of size in terms of combat. This is an indicator. And so remember that as a dungeon master, 
Remember the size of your monster during combat situations. And lastly, psionic ability. Goblins have no psionic ability, neither with an attack mode nor a defense mode. Psionics are also not something that I play with or use as a dungeon master, but it's there and it's very much a part of first edition AD&D and it's available for you to use it if you choose to. We may discuss psionics at some later point during this course, or we may not. We shall see, but we certainly won't be talking about that today as we're running a bit short on time. So that arrives us at the end of the stat block. So that was the discussion on stat blocks. If you have any questions regarding stat blocks, please type them into the chat room. After the lecture, we will go through the chat room and take a look at everyone's questions and try to answer all of them if we can. Up next after stat blocks, it is time for us to talk about dungeons. Of course it would be. This is Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons are a major part of this hobby slash game slash wonderful what have you. Those of you who have the 1979 Dungeon Master's Guide, which I'm holding up on screen right now, please turn to page 169. Page 169 will tell you how to create your very own dungeons using the random dungeon generator created by Gary Gygax. With much help from his TSR Hobbies crew, Page 169 spills over to 170 and then onwards to 171 and 172. It teaches you how to generate random dungeons for yourself, for solo play if you choose, or for your adventurers to experience from the other side of the Dungeon Master screen. Page 169 of the Dungeon Master's Guide begins the section by saying, when you need help in designing a dungeon, whether it is a level in your main dungeon or a labyrinth discovered elsewhere, the following random generation system has proven itself to be useful. It must be noted that the system requires time, but it can be used directly in conjunction with actual play. And then he goes on to state, keep a side record of all monsters and treasures and tricks and traps and whatever, essentially creating a normal dungeon matrix for yourself. The tables that begin appearing on page 169 and 170 and the next few pages after that are some of the most valuable pages that have ever been published in this hobby. Take some time as a dungeon master to familiarize yourself with the random dungeon generator. It will become an invaluable tool. The next thing we should discuss is dragons because one never discusses dungeons without also discussing dragons. Am I right? Right. Okay, we're jumping back over to the 1977 Monster Manual here. And you are all now going to turn with me to page 29. Page 29 of the Monster Manual brings us to the dragons section, telling you all about dragons, what age they can be, what size they can be, what color they can be, or perhaps they're not colored, perhaps they are metallic. Page 29 onwards brings you through all of the dragons, from the black to the blue, to the green, to the red, to the white, and beyond. And it tells you the stat blocks for each dragon. It tells you the breath weapons for each dragon. And it gives you some very useful information about subduel of dragons. It also gives you a listing of certain dragons that cannot be subdued. It doesn't really say cannot under any circumstances whatsoever. But it does say that the types of dragons which cannot be subdued are 
uh, let's see, where was it? It was right here at the bottom of page 30. It says silver, gold, chromatic, and platinum dragons cannot be subdued. So I will write them down here. Silver, gold, chromatic, platinum. No player may ever run a character that attempts to successfully subdue, I shouldn't say attempts to, no player controlling a player character will ever be able to successfully subdue a silver, gold, chromatic, or platinum dragon. However, all of the other dragons are fair game. How to subdue a dragon and make it your pet Perhaps you'd like to fly around with it. Perhaps you'd like to cage it and impress your friends. Perhaps you'd like to use it as an icebreaker at parties. How to subdue a dragon. To, to learn how to subdue a dragon, you must turn to page 30. Page 30 says that if a player encounters a dragon, and let's just say for purposes of this class that you encounter a red dragon, dun, 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 and you'd like to subdue it. You've got a sword, you've got a shield, you've got uh, 10 friends with you, and you're all going to team up on this dragon and try to subdue it. Okay, let's say the dragon is from, not from the end of its tail, but, but from its ass, or where its tail starts anyway, to the tip of its head, it measures 150 feet. We'll say its tail measures 20 feet, but forget about its tail. From where, the, from where the tail starts to the tip of its head is 150 feet. I'm sorry, that would be an awfully large dragon. For purposes of this example, let's make it a 15 foot long dragon with a four foot long tail, okay? Good, 15 feet. You and your 10 pals are getting ready to go and attack the dragon, not to kill it, but to subdue it. You make the announcement to the dungeon master. We are going to attempt to subdue the dragon. Okay, fine. It's very important that a player announce that they are attempting to subdue at the beginning of combat. If a player neglects to announce that they are attempting to subdue a dragon, by default, it means that they are attacking the dragon and any damage they do with their weapons is going to be damaging, potentially lethal damage to the dragon. If the players declare to subdue and they begin to attack, let's say all 11 characters want to attack the dragon at the same time. They can do that. However, the surface area of the dragon is described in the monster manual in such a way that there needs to be three feet of surface area for each player attacking the dragon to subdue. So if our dragon is 15 feet, you can have five characters flanking the dragon on its left side. You can have another five characters on its right side flank, and you can have one character attacking its head. Because remember, this dragon for this example is 15 feet long only from the start of its tail to the top of its head. Five characters on the left side flank, each with five, each with, I'm sorry, each with three feet. surface area. Five characters on the left side flank, five on the right, one to the head. It's a 15 foot long dragon from the start of its tail to the top of its head. The characters make the announcement that they are going to subdue. Combat begins, initiative rolls are made. Followed initiative and then now goes the combat situation. <clears throat> During subdual combat, 
all of the damage that's dealt by characters to a dragon is of the bruising variety. Well, bruising or bashing, and that's what the master manual says. So no points. Uh, wait, I'm sorry. Yep, no, that's right. So let's say for purposes of this example that the dragon has 50 hit points. Combat round one involves me not knowing how to type. Combat round one involves attacks done to the dragon and the dragon attacking the players back as well, if it can. Let's say that at the end of round one of combat, the players have dealt 25 hit points of damage altogether collectively to the dragon, which means that the dragon now has 50 hit points remaining. Well, 25%, I'm sorry, 25 hit points at the end of round one means that the dragon has 50% of its health remaining. At this point, at the end of the round, the DM must make a roll 1d100. If the DM rolls, uh, if the DM rolls a 67, that means that you are above the percentage needed for subdual. So the dragon is not subdued. And now begins round two. Round two, same stuff happens. Now, let's say the players deal another 20, I'm sorry, another 20, no, another 15 points of damage to the dragon during this round, meaning that they have now done a total of 40 points of subdual damage to it. This means that of its original 50 hit points, it now has 10 hit points remaining, which means that it now has lost 80% of its health. So because it's lost 80% of its health, DM needs to roll 1D100 and need to roll 80 or below. Let's say at this point now, the DM rolls 98. Whoops, well, that's higher than 80%. So that means the dragon is still not subdued. So we enter round three of combat. And now at this point, we'll say the, the dragon uncorks its breath weapon and exterminates half the party. So now there's going to be only five or six characters left attacking the dragon, still attempting to subdue it. Now, they keep going and keep going, and they keep doing more subdual damage to it. By the end of combat round three, they have inflicted another 25 points of damage to it, of subdual. The dragon now is at 0%, because the dragon has now lost a total of 65 hit points from subdual damage. How much actual damage did the hip, did the, I'm sorry, how much actual damage in terms of hit point loss occurs here? The answer is zero. The dragon is still at 50 hit points. It's just because the players declared that they were attempting to subdue the dragon, the dungeon master now has to keep separate, separate track of notes and keep track at the end of each round to see what the ratio is. We saw ratios of 50%. And then we saw that it had 80%. And then, but now it, it lost more than 100% of its health. So that means there's 0% chance of failure for subdual. I believe I described that a bit incorrectly earlier, but this is the correct way to see it. So once you have a subdued dragon, what do you do? Well, first thing you do is you throw a party, right? That's what I do. Well, it says here that there are 
certain caveats that go hand in hand with having a dragon subdued. On page 30, Gary Gagax writes, a dragon remains subdued for an indefinite period, but if the creature is not strongly held, well treated, given ample treasure and allowed ample freedom, it will seek to kill its captor and or escape. So, also, the older and more powerful the dragon is, the less likelihood there is of it to remain subdued. In fact, the latter sort of dragon is likely to attempt to take over its captor and rule all of his or her holdings. Insert sinister laughter here. Evil dragons will never serve a good master for long, and good dragons are 50% more likely to kill slash escape from a neutral captor, as opposed to one whose alignment is the same as their own. Players may also choose to sell or give a dragon to any other player, or keep the dragon in their own service. Note, dragons cannot be resubdued again unless they actually regain their freedom first. For more information about dragons and dragon subduel, have a look on page 30 of the Munster Manual. And we have two minutes remaining in the lecture. Let's see what else I should get to here real quick. I should get to this. How to keep your players engaged. Number one, involve them in the creative process. Whether it's collaborative world building or exchanging ideas or creating characters together, creating maps, drawing maps, naming places, fleshing them out, creating adventures, whatever it might be, involve them. That's how you keep them engaged. Also, how to keep your players engaged. inspire them. This means that, of course, you'll just have to be yourself. Be your most authentic self. And do not put on airs or try to behave or act in a way that isn't really you. This inspires players to then be their own most authentic selves. And before long, you'll know that the players who have joined you at the table are there because they really, really want to be there and not just because there's nothing else to do. You inspire them. As a dungeon master, it is your job to inspire them. And it is also your job to be inspired yourself. Subject your things to things that will inspire you, whether it's reading or visiting art galleries or visiting museums or talking with old friends or walking through a park or visiting a pond or a stream or seeing new wildlife at a zoo that you've never seen before. I mean, there are, there's just an endless way for you to continue to remain inspired yourself. So another great way to keep your players engaged, be inspired. In short, be inspired and be inspiring. Thanks very much for joining us in today's class. I think this has been great. And now we are going to slide on into our question and A section. Thank you for listening to me ramble on for all this time. I'm going to shut down the whiteboard now and so we can all say hello to the gallery. Hi, everyone out there in the gallery. OK, so now I'm going to just take a quick peek at the chat room and see what sorts of questions popped up here for us to answer. Let's go right back up to the beginning. Headmaster Ryan asks, what flavor of toothpaste should I use if I am DMing? I recommend Aquafresh. It's nice and stripy without too much fluorine. Uh, let's see. Did you write Grim Grape? What is that? Is that, a, is that a flavor that you like? OK, very nice. I've not yet heard of that one. Boudreaux's butt paste is another suggestion by DM Charlie. Very nice, Charlie. That's nice of you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see, Gitano writes, hmm, no seatbelt, but I have a roll bar, so that should even it out. Yes, very nice. We await the soothing tones of my voice. Oh, we do. Okay, very nice. Thank you. My voice. Oh, boy. Okay. 
Uh, let's see, David B chimes in and says, arm class on page 25. Oh, good, very nice, excellent. Everyone uh, might wanna make a note of that. DMG, page 26 and 27. Those are the pages where you'll find the armor, armor class and weapons information. And uh, let's see, uh, somebody complimented our quote about imagination. Yes, very nice, thank you. Is that uh, someone questioned uh, treasure type? Is that individual treasure or lair? Okay, very nice, good question. I think we covered that with the goblin at least. And we talked about treasure type a bit more. Um, Charlie bounced out, no problem. We'll see him next time, I hope. And uh, let's see, what is a dump stat? Asks uh, Headmaster Tom. Um, a dump stat is the stat that you don't really care about. For example, charisma is commonly thought of as a dump stat. Um, and if you are playing at the type of session where you are given the choice of rolling for stats and then placing your numbers into whichever stat you want, if your DM chooses for that to be the way characters are created, then you could choose one stat to be a dump stat. If you want to play a leaf, you want your high stat to be dexterity. If you want to play a thief, you might not care so much about charisma or constitution or wisdom. It's up to you, really. But that's what a dump stat means. And um, interestingly enough, when I'm the DM, there are no dump stats because we do 3D6 in order. Dun, dun, dun. OK, now next up here on the questions, we've got, uh, let's see. Great words about authenticity and inspiration. Thank you. Appendix N is good for inspiration as well. Yes, Appendix N is a famous page in the 1979 Dungeon Master's Guide in which Gary Gygax lists all of the literary works that inspired him to put together not just the Dungeon Master's Guide, but everything that came before it, including the Player's Handbook and also the Monster Manual and all of his other work with the early basic edition of the game, and of course, the three little ground books and all of his work with Dave. Appendix N is cool to familiarize yourself with. I don't necessarily recommend that you run out. I don't recommend that you run out and start reading all of those books, but if you were to read at least one or two of the books from Appendix N, I think you'll find that, that you have done yourself a favor. Uh, now, up next, let's see. Uh, Christian. Hi, Christian. Christian writes, I thought it started 300 CST. Ha <laughs> ha. Very funny. Um, I thought it started uh, 3 o'clock EST, um, I think. And I believe it did. But um, but that's OK. I'm glad you're here. Got to see some of what's going on. Headmaster Tom asked the question, how do I know my character's movement rate? That's very simple. Ask your dungeon master. Or if you are the dungeon master, you determine what the character's movement rate will be for yourself. Knowing that a movement rate for a halfling or a dwarf or a gnome is generally around six, knowing that a human movement rate is around 10 and an elf movement rate is around 12, that'll give you some idea. Incidentally, the movement rate of a half elf is 11. Now, when I give you numbers for movement rates, I'm talking about square feet times 10. It's an abstract way of thinking, but it's a good, useful math, and it's very good for understanding distance and the measurements of space that a DM needs to be mindful of when doing all of this wonderful dungeon mastery. If Tom has an elf that's movement rate is 12, this means that he can move 12 square inches on a, on a square inch battle mat grid. It means that he can move 120 feet in one round. One round, same as one minute of game time. So I hope that answers your question, Headmaster Tom. And then uh, Dave raises a question, which is pretty cool about helmets. And, uh, and Dave asks, if, uh, if I'm happy with the rules for helmets, I like to treat them more like shields, such as, uh, such as A minus to armor class. Okay, that's cool. Am I happy with the rules? Um, I guess, I, I think of them as guidelines. And over the years, I've just, uh, more, that more or less adapted the, 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 the structure of wearing a helmet gives your head the same armor class as the rest of the body. Not wearing a helmet gives you AC 10. But does the addition of a helmet itself subtract from AC? 
I don't choose to walk that way, but if you feel that way as a dungeon master, then you can absolutely do that. Um, as for why I don't particularly feel that a helmet should improve armor class, the, the quick and easy answer to that question is, I am real big on challenge factor. And I know that the players are already, already stacked in terms of weapons and saving throws and everything else they need to protect themselves. They got enough help already. And so the last thing they need is, is one more little bonus that's going to improve their armor class and maybe help them sleep easier at night. I don't know. I want our players to be looking over their backs. I want our players to be, um, to, 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 to be coming away from our, our adventure sessions feeling like they were challenged. And um, so I guess that explains why I don't, I don't skew towards having a helmet improve armor class. But if a dungeon master wants to do that, that's absolutely fine. I see dungeon masters um, even having characters be created where the players can then choose whatever they rolled and add them into whatever stat they want, which is not what I do, but, uh, but I'm okay with that because being a dungeon master means that you have codified a certain set of parameters for your session and there needs to be a certain codified set of parameters for every session and um, i'm hesitant to use the word rules because i think rules is a dirty word um, but i do like the fact that there are boundaries in place and it is up to the dungeon master to move the boundaries however he or she feels most comfortable with i would absolutely support a decision by a dungeon master to have a helmet and uh, improve their armor class score by one. Absolutely. Because I will forever fight for your right to have the sessions run the way you want them to run. Dungeon Masters put a lot of work into a session. Does that mean that the players will always do what the Dungeon Master wants? Of course not. In fact, more often than not, the players will do something entirely different, but, but that's okay because that's part of being a Dungeon Master. You have to roll with the punches and you have to be ready to adapt and to adopt changes and be ready to think on the fly. And if you find yourself hunting through a book for a rule and it's eating up three, four, five, six minutes of playtime, it's going to make some of the players wonder what's going on here. And that at, that's the point when you might start to lose the table a little bit and you might start to see lots of chit chat happening at the table. Um, there should be certain things set in place to maintain order at the table. And I don't mean wrapping a gavel like the judge in a courtroom, but there should be some method, some means of quieting down the table when it starts to get a little too out of control. What's the best way to do it? Keep the game moving. Don't stop to go hunting through books for rules. Make a ruling and move on. Rulings are better than rules. In fact, guidelines themselves are better than rules too, if you think about it. The planting of the seed of imagination is what will ultimately never steer you wrong. And when it comes to keeping a table engaged and keeping players engaged and in the moment, just keep it moving. And if it helps you to pick out certain players to role play certain NPCs, go for it. I don't see that happening really all that often, uh, but that's something we incorporate a bit with our sessions and it helps. It helps to keep folks from looking at their watch or looking at their smartphones or wondering uh, wondering who's the guest star on Merv Griffin tonight. Um, so, yep, I think that uh, should answer that question. Um, Bill raised a question now. Bill says funneling or no. Ooh, funneling or no. How much beer you got? Um, funneling is a uh, popular way to, to winnow down and uh, separate the wheat from the chaff when creating brand new zero level dudes and dudettes. Um, I've also seen folks do this with first level characters too. Funneling is a cool idea. I don't do funneling myself, but um, I do always enjoy hearing about funneling when others do it. Funneling is a, a nice way to find out which character your player is going to use in a session. As a dungeon master, if you decide that you want to run a funnel, I say more power to you. Let me know how it went. I'm always curious to hear about how those things go. And the funnel is this. A player enters three, four, maybe two even, or three or four characters into an adventure. 
And it's an adventure that's a little more dangerous than they can handle by themselves. But they know this going into it, but they don't give a shit. So they go in, let's say three of the four characters that went in, I'm back, sorry. Three of the four characters went into it and they died. One survived. So that would be the one who goes on to the main adventure now with the Dion. So I like funneling. I do think it's, it should just be a short, quick thing, uh, maybe spread out over one or two sessions at the most, but that's uh, a way to pave the road that puts the players on the road towards the real adventure itself. So funneling is cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question about that. And does anyone else here have any questions for me? No? All right, well, I think we had a great session here today. I want to thank you all for joining in. And uh, please uh, keep in touch with us at Ben Shilidale Academy and watch for what's coming up next. There's a whole bunch of events happening now. And we just made the announcement that our good friend Brian is going to be running WG4, the Forgotten Temple of Tharazdun. So keep an eye out for that. If you're looking to jump in on a classic Gary Gygax adventure, check that out and keep in touch. Stay with us at the Academy. Lots of great stuff coming, including more contests. And I think that's all for now. So we'll see you at the next class. My name is Timothy Connolly. Thanks for joining us. I apologize for all of my spelling errors on the whiteboard. And I'll see you next time. Now I'm just going to shut down the recording in five, four, three, two, and.